Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome uh, to our forum. Our adult ed forums are designed to engage our hearts and our minds around various issues and how those issues intersect with our faith and our discipleship journeys. One of the early theologians, Anselm, is credited with the phrase faith seeking understanding or fideus quorum intellectum, which reflects on the intersection of faith and intellect. That is our goal with these adult ed forums. We are inviting our members to come and learn and reflect and hopefully grow in both our faith and our understanding. Today we'll engage in a conversation about the intersection of faith and gender. These issues have been in the news a lot in the last couple of years, and this morning we have invited a group of panelists with a wide variety of professional and personal perspectives and experiences who will help us consider these questions and add knowledge and insight where it's needed. There will be a time closer to the end of the hour for people to ask or share questions, and if, if you prefer to write down your question, there is, um, it says there's paper available to you. Okay. Um, but let's, uh, we'll, we'll start our conversation, but let's begin with prayer. Let's, uh, let's pray. Loving and gracious God, as we gather before you today, we come with open hearts and minds, seeking your guidance and wisdom. We humbly acknowledge the diversity among us, recognizing that each individual is fearfully and wonderfully made. Lord, grant us the strength to approach this adult ed forum with a spirit of understanding, empathy, and respect for one another. Help us to recognize the common humanity that binds us together, remembering that each person is a precious child of God. May your love be the guiding force that leads us in our discussions today. Grant us the patience to listen attentively, the courage to speak truthfully, and the humility to acknowledge that we are still learning. Let your spirit of love prevail, fostering an atmosphere of compassion. Remind us, O oh God, of the greatest commandment, to love our neighbors as ourselves. There is both a commandment for love of others and love of self in there. May this command be etched upon our hearts as we engage in this forum today. Help us to embody the love that Christ exemplified through our words and our actions. Lord, we ask your blessing upon this gathering, that it may be marked by understanding, compassion, and love. In your holy and loving name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, we, um, we've assembled an incredible panel today to have this discussion about faith and gender. And so, uh, and I have questions that were sent to the panelists ahead of time so they could reflect on them. And the first question is, panelists, could you please introduce yourselves and share why you decided to join in this conversation today? And we'll go uh, left to right and then on to our panelists who have joined us by Zoom. So we'll start with Lyndon. That's great. I was thinking you were going to start with a cyber <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you speak up because the microphone is all the way over there on that uh, owl. Okay. So. Well, that, that's good. Hello, owl. I hope that you can hear me. Um, so I'm Lyndon. Um, many of you have known me as Linnea in the past. Um, and I still go by Linnea professionally. Uh, I'm a therapist. I work with trans and queer um, adults, adolescents, it's not the only group of folks that I work with, but I do work with uh, that population, and so that's part of what I bring to the table, as well as a lot of personal aspects, personal lived experience. Um, many of you also know that I identify as queer and as trans, just specifically as genderqueer, which kind of means fluid, expansive gender experience, and I use they, them pronouns. That's not on here. Um, although I'm kind of wishing it were, because that would help. But anyway, so and I'm here um, just because I love this church. I love the people here. I know that there's a lot of queer and trans youth and, and adults here as well. And that matters to me. Their experience matters to me. Um, making sure that people understand, receive education, just have the opportunity to explore and listen and learn. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Oh, I'm Dr. Bree Meyer. I am a professor at Hastings College in the biology department. Um, my main 
work is uh, teaching anatomy and physiology to our pre health and pre nursing students in particular. And uh, I did my PhD on the evolution of hormone function. And so um, I think I bring a unique perspective from the scientific realm because I'm always reading the medical literature as well as the activism literature um, and trying to see how they compare. So my job, I feel, is preparing our next generation of healthcare professionals to improve on the wrongs that have been done in medicine historically. And so I also work as um, a member of PFLAG and a member, uh, well, an advisor to our Gender and Sexuality Alliance at Hastings College. And I, one of the things that I am most passionate about passionate about is educating students on the diversity of gender and sexuality and trying to um, improve students' understanding and correct some misconceptions that are common in our population. So um, I wanted to be here today to offer my expertise and to answer questions that anyone has about the science and what has been shown um, in scientific studies in particular. Thank you, Bree. We'll move to our Zoom panelists. And right now, John is on the screen. So I'll ask John to introduce himself first. Thank you, Greg. And good morning, uh, everyone. My name is John Curtis. Uh, I'm a pastor in the Presbyterian Church. Uh, many of you know I served as the associate in Hastings. Uh, when my kids were very, very little. Um, our oldest daughter, Anna, was six weeks when we moved um, to Hastings. So I know many of you remember that precocious kiddo as part of the life of the church um, as well. We have uh, three daughters. Um, I currently serve as the stated clerk of the Presbytery of the Twin Cities area. Um, and I know nobody really knows what stated clerks do, including myself. Um, but part of what we do is help interpret like the work of the General Assembly to local congregations. Uh, and so I'm proud to be part of a denomination that uh, is is open and affirming uh, and supports conversations uh, like these. I'm here today because Greg and uh, asked me to, Greg and Damon asked me to, and I, um, as somebody who was born and raised in Nebraska and loves Nebraska, even you know enough to listen to the Huskers basketball game on the radio yesterday, um, I'm deeply saddened by the recent laws that are transphobic and hateful in Nebraska. And so a, a chance to talk about my experience and why uh, we could do better. Um, I, I'm grateful for that opportunity. So thank you. Thanks, John. And um, we'll move to Meg. Good morning. My name is Meg Curtis. Uh, I am married to John Curtis, and we're actually in the same house. We're just in different rooms, so the audio cooperates. Um, so I am a graduate of Hastings College. Um, I participated in programming at First Presbyterian Church and directed Christmas pageants my entire um, undergraduate career. Uh, we left for several years, and then we were back when our kids were tiny. Um, so we have three teenage daughters. Um, and we're a pretty rainbow family. Uh, two of our three children identify as queer. Um, Anna is a trans woman and our daughter Eli is uh, gender fluid. Um, and so I bring up parenting perspective to this conversation. Um, I'm also a librarian. Uh, I'm the programming and outreach librarian at the Plainview Public Library. And so I work with um, all ages of our community. Um, and a significant portion of the young people who use our library um, view our facility as a sanctuary. Um, and so I can't speak to other people's perspective, but what I observe um, is that uh, young people are looking for places where they feel safe with adults who are welcoming. Um, and so as a parent and a library professional, I have a few things to contribute. Thank you, Meg. And Dawn. Hi, my name is Dawn Darling. I'm a mental health therapist in Kearney. Um, 
I specialize in working with uh, trans and gender diverse people. Uh, and I've been doing that for about nine years now. I grew up in uh, Gearing, Nebraska, in an Assemblies of God church. And I was married for 15 years to uh, a man where we were um, pastors and youth pastors for a long time. Um, so I, I, I decided to join this panel because I see the divide between uh, the LGBTQ community and the church. And I know how important it is for people to have something to feed their spiritual side. And the church feeds that for a lot of people. We think that um, that should not exclude the LGBTQ community. And so I'm participating to help bridge, keep that bridge built between the LGBTQ community and the church. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Don. We're glad you joined us. Um, all right. So. I have six more questions. We have 45 minutes. Uh, so uh, we don't have to get all six questions. We'll kind of let the conversation lead where it does. Uh, but if you all were, were sending these questions ahead of time, so you have some sense of where, where we were going on this. Um, it's an open question. And uh, I would say just go ahead and chime in. We won't necessarily go in order. But uh, could you please provide a broad overview of your understanding of the gender and the aspects of gender identity? <laughs> and, and go. <laughs> well, it might be interesting all at once. There's some biblical precedent for that. The cacophony of voices, and we all hear it in our own language. And, no. I wonder if the folks on Zoom might find it easier to chime in and just kind of if um, you give them up your name first, maybe? Sure. Why don't we, uh, would any of our Zoom folks like to take that question first? Uh, Providing a broad overview of your understanding of gender and aspects of gender identity. And Dawn, you're on the screen, uh, at least for us right now. So uh, not to put you on the spot or anything, but you want to go first? Sure, I'll go first. Um, my understanding, uh, I mean, obviously, gender and gender identity, it's all a social construct. We've assigned people genders so that we can put them into categories right and figure out like where they sit in our worlds and so uh, my belief is and my um education tells me that we all have dna and chromosomes and we're all very diverse we're diverse in so many different ways and it's not um difficult to believe that our that people's gender identities are also diverse and so we like to put people like historically in America, we like to put people into two categories, male and female. But as we as we continue to learn about how people are formed uh, in in the uterus and our um, gender, our physical anatomy is formed at a different time than our um, mental than, than the the hormones get flooded into our brains, it's not hard to believe that there, we all get like a different amount of all of that. And so gender identity is who we see ourselves to be at the core of our being, regardless of what our physical anatomy tries to assign us as. Oh, that's all I have. All right. Thanks, Don. Any of our other Zoom panelists want to chime in on this question? John, you've taken yourself off. Sure. Here, so sure. we'll turn over to you. Um, so I, I just am reminded of the biblical story of creation, you know, when um, God said, let there be light and let there be darkness. And there was the first day. Uh, we know that it didn't just like a light switch didn't, didn't just turn off, <clears throat> right? There's a sunset of many different colors before it went from uh, daylight to darkness. Um, and so I think that's what gender is. It's not just a either or binary. There's a whole range uh, of ways to understand uh, gender diversity and gender expansiveness. Um, when I was, I remember a story when Anna was set to be a kindergartner at Longfellow Elementary School. Anna's favorite color had always been purple, always been purple. And we went to like a, the week before school started, there was an orientation with the principal and there was a drawing and Anna won a backpack. And she was so excited to get the purple 
purple backpack. And then somebody said, told her, well, purple is a girl color. Um, and at that point, Anna set the backpack aside and that wasn't her favorite color anymore. And I just, um, I thought, you know, how, how is it that we are such a, a world where we can say this is a boy thing and this is a girl thing when we know from experience that there's that it's so much more shades of gray and and the sunset right before it becomes total darkness thank you john yeah our our daughter Esther had a similar experience blue was her favorite color until she hit public school and then she was told blue was the boy's color and she had to change. Uh, fortunately, fortunately, she's fine. That blue is back to being her favorite color. So, I'm very excited about that. Do you have any more? I don't know if she's frozen. I don't really have anything to add. But thanks. Right. Well, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> How about our panelists who are here in person? <laughs> Well, so, um, I mean, John, John pretty much said how I would see it as well. And, and there's there's kind of a distinction to make between sex and gender, and a lot of people kind of like it, cultures like it. Cultures make assumptions about gender based on biological sex characteristics, but really sex is about you know, essentially it's about sexual organs that, that may be present, uh, primary, secondary, sexual characteristics, biology, and also has to do with mating behavior. Uh, but then, so gender is more, it's the cultural and psychological term that's used to, to identify behaviors. And this is really accept, expected behaviors, norms, standards for genders, again, that are based on assumptions about biology. So where I stand with that is that biology really doesn't have to dictate at all what gender is. Um, and, uh, and the thing about our biology is it's a lot more complex and diverse than we even understand. And so you can make an assumption about somebody's masculinity or femininity based on what you see, but what is actually in the DNA could be entirely different. And so it really behooves us to not make a lot of assumptions of gender. Um, and gender is really, like, I guess in, in my perspective and experience, gender is an experience. Um, I experience my gender. Um, other people have tried to assign it based on what my body has. Um, I used to buy into that. And in my later 30s, I stopped buying into that because I realized that has not been my experience in this world, truly. Um, my experience has been a lot more fluid than that. My experience has been... And my experience has been contradictory to what was expected. Uh, and to kind of bring in the, the kind of faith and spirituality aspect, um, I've been studying a lot of uh, Judaism and Jewishness recently, and so I was really fascinated to learn that the ancient rabbis in the Talmud identified eight genders. Um, they were able to identify, you know, folks that are... are um, born with male or female characteristics and continue to identify that way. Folks that are born with male or female characteristics and those change over time. Folks that are born with male and female characteristics um, but choose to identify with the opposite gender. Folks that were born with no sexual characteristics and um, folks that were born with um, a combination. So my question is, if the ancient rabbis could acknowledge this clear back 2,000 years ago, how is it that we have such trouble these days? Gender has always been understood, really, to be fluid. Uh, so here we are. And I think it's been pretty, most of the points I would make have been covered. What I would add is, that in, even when it comes to biological sex, there's quite a spectrum. If you consider the intersex population, which represents about 5% of the total population, just to put that in perspective, that's about the same that we see in redheaded people in the population. 5% of people identify as intersex. And within the intersex population, 
we've identified more than 150 different presentations of sex where people have differences in the genitalia that are present, the way that they look, or they have some combination of male and female genitalia. And so even when it comes to the male and female biological sex, we're often oversimplifying and uh, excluding an entire group of people that actually represents a, a significant part of the population. And so uh, the issues of gender and biological sex are much more complex than what our culture currently recognizes. And just like Lyndon was saying, you know, historical cultures um, like the Maori people, the Native Americans, uh, there are many populations that have recognized at least three upwards of five or even eight genders. And so um, to say that this is a new thing being invented by the, uh, uh, the new generation is, is sort of short-sighted. And so uh, you also want to consider that as well. Thank you. Um, so the next, that worked really well. So I'm going to do the same thing where I'll invite our Zoom panelists to speak and then our folks in the room. But the next question is, uh, from your perspective, whether that is a personal perspective, a professional perspective, or a parental perspective, or any other perspective, what does or could it mean to be transgender in the world? So I'll just jump right in. Um, I do identify as bigender, so I identify as both male and female. Um, and that's been my identity my whole life, although I haven't um, proclaimed that in the world. And I also work with trans and gender diverse peoples professionally. So I have a couple of different perspectives, but in the same way they merge because I think what it means to be trans in this world is um, I think it means um, <clears throat> being honest with yourself about who you really are, despite what the world tells you you are. And at the core of that being, we all have that journey to go on. And um, it, right now in our country, it's um, obviously like those identities are under fire for various reasons, but it means, um, sometimes it means being scared to be yourself in the world. And sometimes it means being very um, relieving to be honest with yourself and be able to tell people, this is who I really am. And to gain acceptance for who you really are, it's quite, it's a foundational joy that you get to experience when you can be yourself with the people that care about you and they still accept you. Thank you, John. John or Meg, do you want to add anything? So I really can't speak, I can only speak from my perspective as a parent. Um, it is amazing watching your children become themselves or grow in knowing of who they are as people. Um, and for lots of reasons, our eldest two children have transferred from our local public high school to a public arts high school in the Twin Cities area. And the first week, we were apprehensive. It's a school that's just for juniors and seniors. And it's a boarding school, so our kids move away from home when they're 16, which is unnerving for a parent. Um, but the, when we were checking in with Anna, her first week of going to this arts school, um, her reflection was, the least interesting thing about me here is that I'm trans. And so being in an environment where um, people's ability to converse and what their talents are. <clears throat> um, it was exhausting for Anna um, that so much of her previous schooling experience had focused on her gender, um, which in an academic environment is possibly the least relevant thing. Um, and so uh, 
it was such a wonderful experience for us having our child go to a location where um, we didn't need to feel defensive about who she is. Um, it, traveling our country, um, we kind of, I feel a little bit like we're in this little tiny box in Minnesota where our kids are safe to go any place. Um, and we don't have to plan road trips based on where it's legal for her to go to the restroom. Um, um, it's really like, I, if you can imagine going to a theater or a play um, and you go in the bathroom together and then you lose track of each other because it's really busy. Um, Anna will whistle to me to acknowledge that she is in the restroom um, rather than talk to me because she is really concerned that her deep voice is going to make other people uncomfortable and that it might flag authorities to, to come pick and pay an unwelcome visit. Um, it's uh, so based on our geographic location, our comfort levels um, as a family really vary um, based on where we physically are. Um, and so, I, I don't know, that's kind of a little bit of my experience parenting trans kids. Um, people look at Anna all the time, kind of askance. No one ever gives Eli, who is petite and blonde, even with short, short hair and martial arts gear, no one looks at her twice um, because she's small and non-threatening. I don't, I don't know, but it's, um, that's kind of a family perspective on these journeys. Thank you, Meg. John, is there anything else you want to add? No, you, I'll, I'll pass. <laughs> Well, so I kind of checked several boxes from the perspectives of professional and personal, but also parental. I, I didn't neglect to mention that my other two children also identify as gender expansive and uh, just in different names and different pronouns. Um, and it's a very good situation for them, and which even for me being well versed in this area, as you can imagine, it can still be a challenge as a parent to adjust. And, and sometimes when the names and pronouns change a lot, it can, it's still challenging to adjust. Um, what, I, what I will start with is that I am grateful to children feel the liberty to be themselves. Uh, and it, it's and I, I will speak from a personal perspective, it's not easy for them because they have one parent that is supportive and affirming and one parent that is not. Uh, they have a wonderful step-parent, step-mom, who's lovely and uses the right names, right pronouns, does her best. Um, so that, that's a challenge also for me as a parent as well. How do I support my kids and also not make too many, too many ripples in the water that, that create more difficulties for them? And, some other thoughts that I have about what it's like to be trans in the world is it's, it's a lot about being a standard bearer, a bearer, a norm breaker, a rule breaker, um, a mirror to society. And by that I mean, like Don was saying, being authentically ourselves. And sometimes I suspect that some of the discomfort and the reactions that I get are because I'm showing out real in ways people sense that maybe there's something about me that's not showing up real or there's a question that comes up is there something in me that I don't want to see so that's kind of what I mean by the mirror um, and sometimes it means having a target on your back because you are different and because you're very visibly different like Meg was mentioning about her daughter's experience you know your voice will mark you um, other things will mark you other differences uh, if, other and ambiguity, uh, amb ambiguity. I sometimes pronounce things funny. <laughs> um, so that, that puts a target on your back. And I've had a target on my back just, just from people. It, it, most of the time it's Nebraska nice. If there's any questions, if it stays here, it stays here. Some people on the internet feel free to say, um, are, you a, are you a man or a woman? And by that I mean, do you have a penis or a vagina? Stuff like that. Um, yeah, my question, my answer to those questions is I'm a human being. I am a human being. Um, if you uh, 
felt like you were able to identify the gender of the person, you would not ask rude questions about their genitalia. So it is just as rude to ask somebody whose gender you cannot determine. Uh, you know, so leading from the standpoint that we are human beings. Um, we are human beings who are trying to live honestly, fully, joyfully in this world. Sometimes that leads to a lot of suffering and pain. But I can tell you from personal experience, there's more pain and suffering in not living. <laughs> okay. Uh, this next question, I think uh, we've already talked a little bit about it, but I'll, I'll ask it and see if any, anyone wants to add anything else. But from your experience, what challenges or struggles do you see trans people facing in their lives? Is there anything you all on Zoom would like to add? I mean, I just, I just thought I would point out that there's a lot of research. Um, the Trevor Project has done some great research on trans youth, and um, um, there's been some other research um, projects that have given us statistics showing that when trans youth and trans adults are supported in their gender identity, um, they have better mental health outcomes their depression, anxiety, and the, those things are at uh, a typical level for the rest of the population. But when people are not supported or are told that their gender identity is that not what they say it is, um, they have higher um, amounts of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, PTSD, all of the mental health stuff that I have to work with people on. And so um, it, I mean, you can just look at those research projects and know that um, the best thing to do is support people in who they say they are and um, help people in that process um, so that they can have um, good mental health outcomes. And that that's really my concern is that we help people um, have, you know, happy, good, comfortable lives where their gender identity is not their source of stress. <laughs> That's what I have to say. Thank you. Yeah. And maybe when we post this to YouTube, we can put some of those things, but I bet some of that uh, Trevor Project uh, research um, does talk about higher suicide rates of uh, LGBTQI youth and I think that's an important point to make, Don. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Meg or John, anything you want to add? Um, just to follow up on what Don said, uh, one of the statistics that I run into in training over and over again is that for young people, uh, and, and really it's of it's not necessarily just LBGBQ young people, it's any young person where one single supportive adult in their life can reduce their risk of suicide by half. Um, and so all of us have the opportunity to be that adult for young people, um, whether that's in our professional capacity or in our family capacity, it is so important to honor young people for who they say they are, it's our job as adults and faith community people to show up for those young people and to trust them to know who they are and to let them know that they're beloved children of God. That's our job. Thank you, Megan. John, anything else you want to add? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> how, how could you follow that, <laughs> right? Like, thank you, Meg. <laughs> Indeed. Anything else? Uh, speaking of the Trevor Project, um, this is my creativity. My printer started running out of regular paper. But I printed out the Trevor Project's 2023 U.S. National Survey on the Mental Health of LGBTQ Young People. Um, you can go to the Trevor Project and find the link. It's, and it's very enlightening. It, it speaks to a lot of what Meg is saying. Um, what Dawn is saying about the, the aspects of gender identity that end up being stressful to young folks that shouldn't have to be. Um, for instance, the anti-trans legislation that is rampant across the country is having a horrific impact on the mental health and well-being of young folks. 
Um, it's not just having an impact on um, young folks, um, it's having an impact on adults as well. Um, but there's a lot of trans, older trans folks here in Hastings that are afraid that um, rights, the rights are getting um, just rolled back and there's a desire to eradicate us from existence. Uh, that's going to ruin anybody's mental health if you feel like that's what's going on. And it's not just feeling like, it's seeing that this is what's going on. Um, but also, on the other hand, there's protective factors. like And those, those happen in the home, like Meg was saying. That is the job of parents. Like, that's my job as a parent, to support my kids. They know who they are. They're not too young to know who they are. Their brains are not too young to know who they are. Um, you know, maybe we can look at, at brain development and judgment development and all of that, but that does not play into identity understanding. Kids know who they are, they deserve to be supported, and when they are supported in such ways as um, na chosen names and pronouns, um, it can reduce, it, it can reduce um, depression by, like different studies kind of have some different numbers, by, like say up to 71%. Um, it can re reduce suicidal ideation and thoughts by 34%, um, more than that. Like, and even if there's all these other stressful things going on, if there's that support, that makes a huge difference to kiddos. Um, just does. I would just like to add that I have, um, I did a talk recently about um, the issues with the anti-LGBT legislation that has passed in Nebraska recently. And when I read the bill, there were a couple of things that stood out to me as being particularly problematic. Um, for example, um, eliminating access to any gender affirming treatment for trans children is an issue. I think there's a misconception that all possible treatments are irreversibly permanent and um, can have dire consequences later in life. But there's several treatments that are not surgery that are being eliminated um, as a possible treatment for children that are still developing. So if you're someone that feels like, you know, based on the literature about the development of the brain that we should have these kids wait until adulthood to make more, you know, permanent decisions about gender that can be corrected by a surgery and these kinds of things. We are taking away a lot of the things like, for example, uh, hormone blockers, um, which are essentially a treatment where kids can take this and it will prevent puberty from starting because essentially it stops the receptors for their primary sex hormone from causing development of secondary sexual characteristics like facial hair in men. But the thing about these is that they're, they're all, all the research on them has shown that they're temporary. And that if the child were to change their mind, they can stop taking the blocker and go into puberty as normal. Um, and so if the concern is about giving the children time to develop and reflect and understand themselves better, um, we are taking away a lot of the things that would relieve their gender dysphoria during these sensitive years. Um, Hormone treatments like hormone blockers um, have had have not been shown to have any negative effects on long-term fertility or on long-term uh, sexual development. Like if a, if a child takes it for a number of years and then stops taking it, they will develop as the biological gender that's assigned according to their primary sex hormone, and they will be normal. And so. Um, I think one of the things that's upsetting about the legislation is that it's taking away, you know, I can understand some of the arguments against surgery for young people. Um, at least I understand the medical concerns, but we're also taking away a variety of other treatments that have 
been shown to have huge benefits and very few drawbacks. And so um, I think that's one of the main things that I'm most concerned about when it comes to problems facing trans youth in Nebraska. Thank you. All right, then the next question, thinking in your role as either a pastor or a parent or a professional or a person with lived experience, what would you hope that people keep in mind and heart when encountering questions related to gender identity? What would you hope that people keep in their minds and hearts when they encounter questions related to gender identity? We'll start with our Zoom panelists. Sure. Um, so when I, if you think about the history of the church, like whenever the church has drawn a line to say who's in and who's out, we've always got it wrong, right? Jesus has always been on the other side, right? Women can't be leaders or preachers. <clears throat> well, guess what? They're gifted. Um, African-American people, right? Anytime we've drawn a line to say uh, we're in and they're out, uh, Jesus has been on the other side. Um, and so for me, that's a no-brainer in how we welcome uh, and affirm gender expansive folks in our midst. Um, and because, so part of my job as state of clerk, right, is to connect resources with congregations. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Covenant Network, uh, the Covenant Network, uh, which is based in Kansas City, um, says there are two things that any church could do <clears throat> that would be easy um, to signal an openness um, to folks. And that would be to normalize pronouns. So wherever you have name tags to just have pronouns be part of that, because that signals to queer folks or folks that have different pronouns that don't match their their presentation um that it's an open place uh and then to make gender neutral bathrooms uh just make it a safe place for anyone to go to the bathroom without question uh, and i think in nebraska that would be especially a, a big thing to do um you know you began greg by talking about faith seeking understanding and i get that the understanding uh comes but i think um like, don't think too hard, right, to choose love um, and to be open and affirming. Like, you can work to understand it, but also, like, love the people in your midst and be open and affirming to them because they're not going to wait for you to, like, rationalize it and make sense of it. They're going to want to know that you you care about them and that they have a place. Thank you, John. Anybody else on Zoom want to respond to that question? Yeah, I would I would absolutely 100% agree with what John said and I I mean at the end of the day Jesus's teachings were all about loving people, right? And so and and gender diverse people are humans and they deserve um, autonomy. They deserve to uh, the respect and equality to know that they know who they are at the end. So like, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, the everyone is humans. And um, if we give each other love and respect um, and be open-minded, then we will um, know each other better. And we will be able to um, honor each other for who we are. Was there anything you wanted to add to that one? No, I don't have anything to contribute at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Anything from our other panelists? Well, so what I will say is it comes back to humanity. Remember our humanity. Uh, and really, we're, we're all made in the image of God as a creator. And the creator is not limited and what creator can make. Uh, there's a wondrous diversity of human beings. Um, we're all human beings, we're all beloved human beings. And so above all, I would say, well, like I would echo John in saying, choose love. Um, as Christians, and, and this, is, this is a Christian church that loves and follows Jesus. So love and follow Jesus, do what Jesus would do. Uh, Jesus didn't exclude those who dared to be different. Jesus, um, scolded and rebuked those who mistreated anyone. Jesus scolded and rebuked folks who acted in uh, ways of injustice. And so to 
be on the side of justice is to be on the side of love. So let's remember love. And, and in addition, John made a lot of wonderful practical points about um, respecting the use of pronouns and making it a normal thing to have pronouns say on the name tags, which is part of why I mentioned that earlier, because that, that, is, that is a wonderful thing. Um, and, and it forestalls awkwardness and it forestalls confusion. And bathrooms are a big deal. Um, all of those, all of those things are simple ways that support and love can be shown, and it doesn't have to compromise anybody's beliefs or morality. Or even if they're, even if you're in a place of confusion about about sex and about gender and so on, like you can operate from an ethics of love that transcends all of that. I would just add that um, when you're when you're faced with um, one of these issues related to trans folk and you have an emotional reaction, whether that's frustration, oh, now I have to remember that they use a different pronoun than what I would come up with naturally, or um, if you have any sort of negative reaction, I would ask you to reflect on why you're having that reaction. Because the truth is that someone else's gender expression really doesn't affect you at all. And so um, if the, I would reflect on that because if you think more deeply, you might find that your emotion comes from a place of fear of the different or your, it may be anger because this person's existence challenges your current views on you know, what's normal in the world as far as gender. Um, and maybe that will help you make progress because you can identify the root of the problem at that point. Um, and then you can then further, hopefully through some inner work, you know, be able to work through that and get to the point where accepting someone that's different is not so difficult. Thank you. So we've already touched on this, but I, I'd just like to uh, ask, uh, read this question and see if there's any additional things, but assuming that it's best for us to operate out of an ethic of love, how can people in communities be loving towards trans folks? What are some ways that you've learned that trans people want to be supported? And we've already had a couple of good practical suggestions. Are there, are there others anyone wants to share? I just wanted to throw out, I mean, I grew up in a church that had a strong belief about love the sinner, hate the sin type of philosophy. And a lot of churches believe that being trans or gender diverse is a sin. And the Bible doesn't say that. Um, so it's important to know that. I think it's important to accept people to the very core of their being without this disclaimer that we're loving the sinner hating the sin situation. And so um, we can just love people for who they are. I think for folks who are like wanting to go to church, but not necessarily going yet, um, they sense that differentiation. And so if we can get to the place where we just like accept people for who they are, I think that makes a huge difference. And um in, in whether or not somebody feels accepted in a, in a church situation. Thank you, John. Anything else, John or Meg? I'm a little worried because both of your videos are frozen. <laughs> no, nothing to add. <laughs> Dawn has beautiful okay, things Maggie. to say. Let's all listen to Dawn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any more panelists? I'll be back, Dawn. Um, the, the love the sinner, hate the sin is something that I grew up as with as well. Um, and I, I will say that 
what that does to a person, especially a person who is very tender spiritually, is it leaves a deep impression on them that there's something defective about them as a human being, that God, the Creator, could not possibly love them if they um, lived their authentic self. Like it's, it's um, God won't condemn you for being gay. God won't condemn you for being queer. But if you live that way, then forget it. Um, what some of this does also is assume that people who choose to embrace their queerness, who choose to embrace their gender identity, whatever it is, who choose to embrace that fluidity of their being, somehow are incapable of being spiritual human beings. I will say that many of the queer and trans folks said that whether they go to church or not, are among the most spiritual people that I know. And what makes them spiritual is that they care about being the real human beings that they were made. Um, so it is very, very important to remember that, that we also, all of us, have a spirituality of some sort that deserves to be nurtured and nourished. Um, and rather, rather than causing it more pain and trauma, I think it's time that the church starts like doing what Bree said and doing some of that deep inner reflection. Like, why is it? What is it that is so threatening about seeing the spirituality of gender identity? What is it that's so threatening about seeing the spirituality of this human being here in front of me? I would just add that um, there's big consequences to excluding anyone, but especially um, gender diverse people. Uh, it's not just about, you know, the driving them away from the church, but it also perpetuates in much more severe ways in terms of anti-trans violence, which is something that we see every year. We had something around 40 trans people across the country last year that were killed as a result of anti-trans violence. And so I think we need to keep in mind that the small things that we do either help improve our culture or help drive it, in my opinion, in a backwards direction against people. And um, even if you feel that not accepting that person is not the most biggest deal in the world, I suppose, um, you may not realize how the small things that happen to this person day in, day out, accumulate over time and perpetuate um, a hatred and a fear of a group that really doesn't deserve that. Yeah, and if as a church we're going to be about an ethic of love uh, and an ethic of, of flourishing life, um, and this hatred leads to death, either suicide for LGBTQI youth and adults or physical violence against trans folks. It's certainly something to consider. We've got um, a few more minutes here. I don't know if there are any questions uh, from any of our audience members for our panelists. I suppose the one question that lingers in my mind, and this is been such a, a good way to think about so many things, is how to approach folks who have that deep fear that you were talking about, um, when you feel compelled to maybe have them change a little, <laughs> you know, um, reconsider their strident behaviors. Yeah, this is a really good question probably to end on since we're getting near our time. And so I'm going to repeat the question so our panelists can make sure they hear it. But, um, how do we approach people who have fear about this issue or people who are striving about this issue? What can we do to help uh, with that, I guess? Is that, yeah. yeah. Any of our panelists want to respond to that, John? Well, I always send them to my favorite local public librarian um, for resources. <laughs> 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 We have to be sure that we tell people 
that we believe them and that they're safe. Um, the anti-trans, um, anti-human rhetoric that we hear in politics is so loud and it is so, so prevalent um, that unless we find ways to tell people that they are safe with us by honoring their pronouns, by flying pride flags on our homes, by wearing pronoun pins, if we do not tell people, um, they won't know. Um, the default position of many families is unless we see clear indication that our children are safe with you, we do not believe that it's true. Um, people are functioning in positions where literally we believe we're protecting the lives of our children. Um, and unless we see clear indication, the assumption is not a default of safety, um, but that we need to be protective. And so congregations, um, individuals out in the wild, teachers, librarians, we need to find ways of showing that we are safe and to be trusted. Thanks, Meg. Don, anything else you'd want to add to that? Well, and what I've learned, sorry, did you say Don or John? I said Don, but John can certainly <laughs> chime in here. Um, so what I've learned as a the parent of a queer kiddo, right, is become you become an ally or an advocate. And so, like, there's one thing to be an advocate for your kid to make sure they're safe. And then there's another level of advocacy with people that maybe don't understand or experiencing your kid differently. And so, like, for me, it's always the one-on-one -on -one relationship to help people just I mean education is a part of it like gender and identity and sexuality get so confused in the rhetoric that you know helping people understand um and then uh, in a way so you, so advocate um for education helps people I think all right yeah I'll just, yeah I'll just throw out there um doing this and like participating like as a church at the pride events or doing your own like outreach at pride month or whatever is huge word gets around people know like my my clients and i have a group i help facilitate a group a trans support group and word gets around there about what churches are safe sometimes what we find is the pastor is safe and open and accepting but the congregation is a little iffy and so it's like, we don't know, like, yes, maybe the church is open and accepting. It depends on who's there that day if you go to church. So I would just say, like, if you see somebody with weird hair like me, or if you see somebody that might look a little marginalized in, and they come to your church, just like embrace them and remind them that you care about them. Or, you know, it, it's all in your actions. People read people really well, you know, and so they, they can tell if you're uh, an ally or, or if you're um, being judgmental. So I do appreciate the outward saying, I accept you. I'm a safe person. Please know, like, I accept you to the core of your being, but also they doing these kind of, um, um, events and putting yourself as a church out there is beautiful because then you'll also know you're safe to come to. Thanks, Don. Anything else? I'll echo what was said about the value of education, the value of advocacy, allyship, um, and being be careful that your allyship is not performative, as in not in words only. Words do matter. Words do matter an awful lot. But if actions don't follow words, uh, that also makes a huge impact. Um, and to speak to what Don was saying about um, the church and maybe the pastor is safe and maybe a few people are safe and maybe others are not, um, there are ways, all the, and, and such and small things like. It is just small things add up to help shepherd a congregation into understanding here's how, how to operate from this love. Um, and becoming a little more open, a little more vocal about this, it matters greatly. 
open to both the, the queer and trans members of the congregation and to those that are um, in the congregation struggling to understand this. Um, so that all of it isn't on the queer or trans person that shows up to be visible and, and be kind of a lightning rod. But to increase the familiarity, a lot of reason that like to speak to what Sharon was asking about, you know, how do you approach the folks that are so anti-trans and how do you deal with this anti-trans rhetoric? One thing I do is, is I understand that some of this comes from a place of not understanding from, a, you know, uh, and also from a lack of familiarity. So um, I do my part by showing up to church, but that's not where it ends. Um, you know, there are many ways to increase just the visibility and familiarity within within the church. And this speaks to other contexts and circumstances as well. As a therapist, if somebody has like this, you know, what, what Shara is talking about, like a way to approach that is just curious. Like, tell me more about that. Tell me more about your position. Um, you know, you start from there. So that that person also feels heard in the place that they are. That's how you begin to draw them forward. Absolutely. Um, that's exactly what I was going to say. I have, um, over the past, I don't know, 10 years that I've been trying to educate on these topics, um, I've done it the wrong way, many, many ways, um, the wrong way to do it. I will say that if you go in guns blazing to this conversation, which I have done, um, you can actually work against your own cause by reinforcing someone's negative opinion of, of people um, in this category. Um, so I would say that um, approaching from a place of curiosity and getting them to try to put into words more about where this attitude is coming from, and then thinking of yourself as more of planting seeds. It doesn't have to all happen in one conversation, but think about having many conversations with that person and then maybe just making a couple of simple points about how your opinions differ and then, you know, revisiting that another day. Um, I think is actually where you make progress with people that have, you know, pretty staunch anti-attitude. Um, I think the more the more aggressive and confrontational you come to the table, the more turned off that person is to even open up to the subject at all. And so um, I would say coming at it from a place of love and curiosity and wanting to help that person come, become a little more enlightened, I think is going to make the most progress, at least in my experience. Thank you. I actually hate to end this discussion because I think it's been very fruitful, but uh, church starts in about six minutes, and I've got to go get my, uh, my stuff together. This is the problem of having the, uh, the pastor also be the facilitator of this, but thank you all to the panelists. Um, I'll follow up with each of you, uh, and again, thank you. I appreciate it, and I appreciate uh, you all for coming, and uh, yeah, we will, the conversation will continue as we, we, as we continue our journey on this, so thank you all.